Hi there. This video is my attempt to answer the question, is the black box sequencer right for you? Uh, kind of what are the pros and cons? And I think more importantly, is it worth your time into diving into it, into learning that ecosystem and seeing if, if it's something that's going to do what you want it to do? Um, so this is video is really more for people who are thinking about buying the black box or shopping around for it, comparing it to other things. Um, and a bit of my bias is that I'm really partial to the electron sequencer. That's kind of what I consider to be the gold standard. And I think that um, everything I do when I'm talking about any sequencer is pretty much comparing it to the electron one. Um, I've also used other sequencers like from Arturia and Novation. So I have some other experience around that. And then of course I've used like piano rolls and a DAW and stuff like that. Um, but I think that uh, in terms of hardware sequencers out there, the Electron one is, uh, you know, it's very popular, it's very well known, and I think it makes sense to draw comparisons between the two, especially because I'm sure a lot of people that end up watching this are going to be trying to make the decision of whether they should get the Digitact or the Black Box. And that's, I think, a pretty fair comparison. They're around the same price point. Um, they're both samplers. They both uh, kind of have the sequencer functionality. So it's, uh, it's pretty easy when you're just looking at the spec sheet to see that the Black Box is a better sampler as compared to the Digitact and a lot of other samplers out there, um, just in terms of the specs and its you know, sample recording length, its ability to deal with long sample files, all that kind of stuff is excellent. And so if you're looking for something primarily for sampling, uh, you know, recording audio, playing back long audio files, the black box is fantastic for that. But where it's harder to compare it is in the sequencer and the associated song mode. So let's try to dive into that a bit. Um, so first of all, with the kind of the structure of the black box, everything is in 16 pads. So uh, these 16 pads are like 16 slots in which you can put your sounds, your samples. And each of those slots, um, it can be a single sound, uh, or it can also be a long sample that's sliced up. So it, could, it can be, you could basically, you could have an entire drum kit in one, inside one pad if you want. Um, and then of course, each one has polyphony. You can set the polyphony you want. It's up to 16 uh, voices of polyphony per pad or up to 32 total for the whole system. Uh, so basically 32 voices to share around 16 different pads and it's more than enough. So that's, um, these are all kind of limitations on the, you know, the voices and the polyphony, but how does that work with the sequencer? Well, with the sequencer, it's also, um, it's also broken up into these 16 groups, but it's a bit more complicated than that. It's, it's more, there's more layers to it. Um, oh, I should mention also, I'm talking about the, um, the version 3.0 and later firmware, uh, where there was a big revamp of the sequencer and song mode between versions two and three. So I'm talking about the most recent version. So in uh, the new sequencer here, we still have 16 different sequencer slots. I'm gonna call them slots. I'm not really sure what the official term is. So I think the official term is actually sequencer pads, uh, but to me it's confusing when we talk about like audio pads versus sequencer pads. So in my mind, it's easier to call them sequencer slots. And um, I wouldn't call them tracks though, because each slot can contain up to 16 tracks. Um, so if you think about like an electron sequencer, uh, like the Digitact, for example, uh, it's got eight audio tracks, eight MIDI sequencer tracks, and like that's it. That's it's a pretty simple thing to understand. Each audio track has a sequencer, as well as there's you know eight additional MIDI sequencers. Uh, so that's like pretty easy to wrap your head around. You have a total of 16 possible things to work with there, right? Well, here with the black box, each pad uh, or, or each sequencer slot uh, can sequence all 16 pads of the audio on the audio side. Um, or they can also be used to send out MIDI. And so basically that means that each one of these um, can send out 16 different MIDI signals, like one on each of the 16 MIDI channels simultaneously per step. Um, and that's a lot. And, that's, and then there's 16 of those. <laughs> so 16 times 16. Um, and then inside each one of those, there's four layers. They're, they're numbered or lettered uh, A, B, C, D. And the layers I think of is kind of like variations. Um, so you can have your, you know, say your melody and then like a variation on that, or you can have a drum pattern and then like a fill pattern, that kind of thing. You can use them for whatever you want, but I think that's the most obvious use case for them. And so we have 16 slots 
Each of them has 16 tracks, and then you have four layers per, uh, per slot, but that also means per track, right, that you can switch between. So if we do that math real quick, so 16 times 16 times 4 equals 1024. So that basically means that per project, so they call it a preset in electron parlance, it's a project. It's basically like the root folder that holds all your stuff, all your sounds, all your samples, all your MIDI files, all that stuff. Um, in each one of those, you have 1,024 different, different sequences, basically, that you can build into that, which is too many, frankly. You don't need that many. <laughs> you don't need anywhere close to that many. Um, but that's what this is capable of if we're talking about upper limits. And um, that's pretty impressive compared to everything else out there, right? Like I said, with the Digitact, you know, you're, you're looking at 16 things, you know, audio plus MIDI, uh, 16 different tracks that you can play with per project. And of course you can then pattern chain them, you know, but it's, um, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot. And the, the kind of the amount of power that comes from that allows you to go really deep, but it also, it's kind of, um, it can be too much. I think it can be like overwhelming because you can go deeper than you really need to or want to a lot of times. So I think that's one of my primary criticisms of the whole um, sequencer kind of ecosystem here is that it's a bit too deep for its own good. There, it would be really nice if there were ways to purposefully limit it. Um, I think the most obvious limitation that I would ask for is that there should be a way of having each of the sequencer slots only sequence a single pad. Uh, that would be a really simple way of doing it and it would align more with a lot of the other sequencers that are out there, I think. And you could turn on this kind of full control mode if you want, but with the absence of that kind of a feature, basically you have to, um, you have to use the whole complexity of this. Well, not exactly, but what the way I see most people using it and the way I've mostly used it also, especially if I'm trying to sequence um, like drums, for example, like one shot samples, um, is that I will you know, select an audio pad then switch to the sequencer and make sure I have that same one selected and then record my MIDI in. And when you do it that way, um, it makes it, first of all, it just makes it easy to remember, you know, of like pad one, sequencer slot one, pad two, sequencer slot two, etc. cetera. Um, but more importantly, if you're then playing your song back and using this uh, sequencer screen, it allows you to individually mute and unmute uh, the MIDI, the sequencer tracks. And that's really useful if it's something like a, you know, like a drum pattern, if you wanna be able to selectively mute the snare or the open hat or something like that without muting the entire rest of your drum pattern, that, and you wanna be able to do that through the MIDI sequencer, then that's what you do. Now, of course, you also have an audio uh, mixer, right? So you can just mute the audio while letting the sequencer continue to run, and that may be a simpler solution in a lot of cases. Um, but even still, if your, um, it, it can basically it can just get a little complicated if you have an entire drum pattern in a single sequencer slot because you may mute it by accident or you may just want to break it out more than that and there's kind of no easy way to so the way that you would break it out like let's say you were finger drumming on like a pad controller and you finger drummed your entire uh, rhythm section in there and it's all saved into a single slot and you want to break it out so you have one slot per sound right, one slot, slot per sound in your drum kit. Well, the way that I would do it is I would copy that sequence into every single pad that I want it to be in, and then go into each one and delete everything except for that one track that I want. You know, so if it's the rim shot, I go in there and I delete every other drum sound except for the rim shot in terms of the MIDI data. And that's, it works, but man, it's cumbersome. It's not a, it's not a great workflow. And so for that reason, I don't really love the black box for one-shot drum sequencing. Um, I prefer to use the Electron one for that because it's just way more straightforward. And um, you also, I mean, yeah, basically it just it allows you to kind of work with mute groups and choke groups and stuff like that, I think in a more fluid and intuitive way. So uh, if you're looking for something that's going to be primarily for sequencing rhythm and using um, a lot of different instruments, like, like you have a very big drum kit you're playing with, and you want to be able to selectively mute and unmute those things really quickly and easily, I would steer you towards the Electron sequencer for that reason, or for that purpose. Um, 
However, there's something that the electron sequencer and a bunch of the other ones don't do very well, uh, which where I think the black box really shines. And that is when it comes to sequencing long melodic parts, um, especially kind of like meandering stuff. And so when, when I say that, I'm talking about kind of the, the type of stuff you'd hear in like classical music and jazz. I don't know, it's just kind of traditional Western music. A lot of it is going to have um, these melodic parts that, that really just kind of wind around and like take their time, they're meandering, right? Um, you know, actually a lot of the music I grew up on was like psychedelic rock and that too, you know, you'd have like these long 20 minute guitar solos and stuff like that, right? So if, if you kind of want that type of uh, ability in your, your MIDI sequencer to be able to just play long things in and have it record, well, the black box is actually really good for that because the, um, if we go into the like piano roll view here, um, the max step count is 256. So 256 steps. Um, let's do a little more math. Okay, so 256 steps um, is 64 bars if you're playing 4-4 four, four time with four uh, beats per measure, basically. So um, that is a good long piece of music, basically. Whereas a lot of the other sequencers um, that I've mentioned already, uh, Electron, Novation, um, uh, Arturia, those all have limits of 64 steps. And there's others even like the Korg sequencers all have limits of 16 steps. So, um, you know, we're talking about a huge difference in terms of the, the length of piece or a phrase that you can write and record in here. Now, of course, nothing's gonna compare to your DAW where you can just have an, basically an infinite length sequence. Um, and this isn't that, but it's far more generous than everything else I've found out there in hardware. And so I think, um, especially if you are a keys player and you wanna be able to play, you know, two-handed kind of a piano style, like a jazz piano type style, where you're playing a lot of notes. Um, and so you, first of all, you need a lot of polyphony in your MIDI sequencer. Um, and also you wanna be able to play longer phrases, but you still want it to be able to loop eventually, right? You wanna play a long phrase and loop it. I mean, or maybe not, you could have it just play once, but I think if you're using a MIDI sequencer, it's probably because you want something to loop um, or you wanna be able to like have it be, you know, your part one and then you go do something else and then you come back, like bring it back later in the song. Um, or maybe you just want it to play all those MIDI notes so that you can tweak all the settings on your synth and like really dial in the sound while it's playing. Any of these are valid reasons. And um, these are all, I think, things that the black box sequencer does really well. So basically you plug in whatever keyboard uh, synth you want, or it could be, you know, big drum pads, whatever it is your, your preferred interface is. You plug it in, you go to town on it, you record these long phrases into the sequencer and then you don't really edit them <laughs> because the other part where it breaks down for me is that if I'm doing what I described of playing like a long two-handed uh, you know, piano style piece, um, you know, if there's some wrong notes in there or something or something that I just feel like was a bit off, you can go into the piano roll and you can find those individual ones and you can edit them just like you would on a DAW, but it's really a cumbersome process um, because basically you just have this small screen the in individual notes are just tiny on there and being able to like zoom in and scroll around and find a particular one, especially in a longer piece of music is just, um, it just takes too much time in my opinion. And uh, it's just kind of too fiddly. And so you can do it, um, but I wouldn't, it's not my preference. And if I played something, you know, where I just, I'm like, that was the take I needed. I, I'm not, I'm never gonna be able to replicate that but this one note was wrong, then sure, I would do the work to go in there and change that one note. But um, more often than not with the sequencer, I find myself recording something in and be like, mm, no, it's not quite right. I'll just erase it and do a whole nother take and just keep doing takes until I get one that I think is right. And um, I'm finding that is just a better workflow for this. And so in that sense, you could think of it as like a MIDI recorder and playback device um, as opposed to a sequencer where you're individually going into each step and changing settings, right? So um, that's kind of where I'm finding the black box sequencer really thrives is in these kind of long melodic pieces and phrases um, where you're fine with just doing multiple takes if you don't get it right the first time. 
and you don't need to then go in there and like tweak things per step. Um, you just want to record what you want and then it is what it is. Now, of course, you can also be recording audio that same way uh, and, you know, simultaneously you can record the audio of what you're playing. Um, but like I said, there's advantages to recording the MIDI in that you can then have it play back and be tweaking the audio live, uh, you know, dialing in the sound, trying out different patches on what you just played and stuff like that. All that's great. And that's the same reason why you'd want to record MIDI into a DAW as well, right? So um, that's hopefully kind of s captures what I'm trying to express about where the the black box works very well for melodic pieces, especially long pieces that a lot of other sequencers simply can't record because of that 64 step or shorter limitation. And then also where it's, um, it's not the type of thing where you're gonna wanna go through with a fine tooth comb, most likely, maybe you will. But for me, I don't want to. Um, I wanna just record, do another take if needed, and let it be as it is. Now, also, if you're looking for something that really does allow you that per step granularity of going in and tweaking what every step does, not just the note value, but also the note length and the, you know, all the different parameters of where the filter cutoff is at that moment and stuff like that, definitely, again, I would steer you towards the electron sequencer. That's its forte, that's its thing. You go through step by step in your song and like tweak everything and make it just kind of really tight and perfect how you want it. Um, I think the black box, for me, it's a lot more of a fluid kind of thing. I'm not gonna be so analytical with it. I'm just gonna kind of play into it. M similar to how you might use a looper, like an audio looper um, or a MIDI looper, right? So I guess you could say that's kind of how I use it as like a MIDI looper, but it's better than a MIDI looper in that I can go in there and individually delete certain notes or change them if I really want to. Whereas on a lot of other MIDI loopers, you don't have that option. You just, you get your loop, then that's it, right? So, um, so yeah, that's, I'd say the way that I've learned to use it so that I, I'm leaning into its strengths and kind of staying away from what I think are its weaknesses. So um, let's switch to the song mode here. The song mode actually is great. I think it's fantastic. And again, it was recently re renovated in the, the version three firmware. So if you've used the older song, song mode, you gotta see the new one because it is different. Um, there's definitely some like kind of weird I don't know, quirky stuff in the sense of like wrapping your head around the way that, that they want you to think about the song structure, but it's not that hard. And um, it's actually very similar to the Electron song mode, which I also think is excellent. Um, but because the you know sequencer has these longer step lengths and um, because it's so much better at capturing large amounts of polyphony, um, it just allows you to do things that a lot of the Electron ones can't, right? So um, I think that the song mode actually is a really strong selling point, um, but it's not really performative. It's going to be more like if you want to build a backing track that you then play on top of. So for example, I think um, if you are a guitarist or some sort of a string instrument player, um, such that both your hands are just busy the entire time you're playing your music, and but you want you know at home uh, to be able to write all your drum sections and all your, you know, bass lines and your like accompaniment stuff and have this just play it. You can do that. Now, of course, you could also play those as just audio files as samples, right? You don't have to do it with a sequencer and a song mode. But again, there's a lot of advantages if you want to be able to play your instrument and then like once in a while reach over and tweak a filter or tweak different things on a hardware synth, you know, um, being able to play your stuff back as MIDI sequences in a song mode is going to let you do that. And that's going to, I think, be a really, um, a really kind of good way of combining more traditional acoustic instruments, or at least, you know, more traditional instruments with um, electronic instruments. And I think that that's um, one of the primary use cases, or like one of the primary strengths of the black box is as the backing track uh, MIDI sequencer player for, you know, one or two other little hardware boxes, synths or effects or something like that. Um, also, by the way, if you're into modular, um, it can be a CV sequencer as well. Um, it won't do it out of the box. You're going to have to load in a, effectively a sample pack of CV notes, but then you can sequence those notes and send it out. And the, the outputs on the back here are DC coupled, which means that you can take a cable from here directly into your modular system and just use this as the primary sequencer. So same idea if you want to play you know, some other instrument alongside a modular, 
setup, you could use this to sequence the whole modular setup um, with CV and gate, and uh, then be able to kind of reach over and tweak knobs and do things on the fly while you're performing with your other instrument. So I think th those are both really great use cases for this, and um, they're things that I you know, might be exploring in the future as well. I don't play that many traditional acoustic instruments, but um, I'm thinking about ways of incorporating that. So I think that, that could be a really fun, really fun way of doing it and um, a really strong reason to go for the black box. And that, um, on that note too, I think that the kind of the abilities and limitations of the black box sequencer and song mode, um, and, you know, and as an audio sampler and player, they kind of really lend themselves, well, they, they don't, they don't uh, force you to make a certain style of music. They're very open and versatile in that like, I could see, you know, a bluegrass band using one of these maybe, <laughs> um, or, you know, some, some, some sort of a, um, more kind of traditional guitar and drums and bass and, you know, banjo, mandolin, and, you know, whatever kind of stuff, instruments you're going to have on stage. These types of, uh, performing groups can use the black box as a tool to play textures, sounds, uh, you know, maybe field recordings, backing tracks, transitions between songs, all kinds of stuff like that. And, um, it's like it gets you kind of some of that maybe electronic flavor in your music um, or just like sample flavor without having a whole blown, you know, full blown MPC or electron setup or whatever. It's going to be a lot, uh, give you a lot more options in the types of music you want to create. Whereas I think a lot of these other sequencers are, they kind of pigeonhole themselves in that they're really good at certain things. So like, the Electron one, I think, is, you know, the best sequencer for, like, techno and IDM style music um, because it's it really kind of forces you to work in these loops, in these very tight loops, and the timing is really tight, and so it's great for these really complicated drum patterns and rhythm patterns and, you know, making these different pattern chains and jumping around and tweaking stuff on the fly. Like, I love that about it. It's super fast and fun and, like, hands-on. Um, but it's it's not something you're going to be able to do while you do something else necessarily. And um, I think there's other things like the MPC and the SP404 that are really tuned in for hip hop specifically. They um, of course you can make whatever style of music you want on them, but the tools they give you, the effects, um, you know, the way they handle recording and sequencing and stuff, it just works very well for hip hop. And you know, you look at hip hop artists, and these are the types of tools that they choose to use because why would you force yourself to use something that's not well suited for that? Um, I will say I've seen actually some people making some really good hip hop on the black box also, so I wouldn't rule it out uh, for that. But if you, you know, it's, it's maybe just not quite as straightforward as something like an MPC or a 404. Um, so I think really the black box though covers kind of every other genre. Like if you don't have, if, if you're not trying to make music in a genre in which there's already like a thing that's, you know, niche focused on your style of music, then the black box kind of covers all bases. And I think especially if you're coming from a more acoustic uh, instrument background, right? You're coming from guitar or piano or something like that. And um, you want to just kind of start stepping into this world of electronic music and sampling. And you want to, you know, maybe sample yourself playing guitar or making your own little, you know, flute riffs or whatever, and work that in with your music. Um, also working in field recordings, the sounds of birds chirping, all that kind of stuff. Like, I think the black box is fantastic for that. And it is probably going to be better or a more straightforward workflow than a lot of the other devices out there that do similar things and are in the similar price category. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm finding the black box uh, to be my, my go-to for kind of long melodic stuff and also for adding, anytime I just want to add samples, which for me is often adding textural samples, um, like maybe a bit of static or a bit of like uh, the sound of a blank cassette tape playing or you know blank vinyl playing to get that kind of bit of like grit and, and dirt on it. Um, I like that kind of stuff a lot. You can also resample with it, which means that you can take a file or take an, a sound, an audio sound, uh, you know, record it internally in itself and then keep doing that over and over while you degrade the signal on each recording. 
and you can get some really cool like kind of distortion and grit from that process of iteratively uh, destructively resampling your sound so that's super fun a lot of devices can do that black box can do that as well um, I also want to mention that if you are looking at this sequencer and um, you just you know for various reasons you're thinking ah, eh, this just this isn't the one for me um, there is a lot of use case for the black box that doesn't use the sequencer at all and uh, so if you kind of look into the sequencer in the song mode and you think, ah, I'm never going to use it. It doesn't do this that I want it to. It doesn't do parameter locks, for example. It doesn't. Um, or it doesn't sequence MIDI CCs. It doesn't. Um, these are big limitations compared to other sequencers out there. And um, if, if those types of things are just like a, you know, that's a hard no for me. I can't, I can't use that sequencer. That's fine. Don't let that uh, take the black box completely off your list because it still has a lot of real usefulness in the way that it deals with loops and audio loops. And so if, um, and I, I'd say that's actually one of the primary ways that I found myself using it is as a loop player. And uh, the way I think of it is kind of like having uh, 16 different tape loops in one box. Um, it's like as if I had 15, 16 different tape loops going at once. Now, usually I don't actually use all 16, but you know, I might use two or three or four at a time. And if you can have the loops interact with the sequencer in which, you know, if you want a loop to come around and every time, you know, be really tight in where it starts so that all your loops are in sync, then you're going to use the sequencer for that. And that is pretty easy. It's just putting it down a single step at the start of every, um, every bar, every sequence. And um, that's pretty straightforward. But the way I like to use it is not like that. I like to have all my loops be different lengths and I like to just start them at random times and let them loop on their own schedule and which means that the loops don't sync up they are asynchronous and they will drift over time in terms of how the sounds line up with each other because if i have you know one loop that's seven seconds long and another that's five seconds long you know they're going to be slowly kind of getting off and on and like out of phase and back into phase over time and i love that and i love if i'm making more ambient music um having those types of things, even if it's just texture, like, a, you know, like the sounds of static or something, having that be in a loop that's not perfect, I think really adds a lot of kind of that organic and human feel to music um, because it's adding imperfections basically. And there's, there's ways, even if it's something like static, if it's in a perfect loop, your brain can kind of latch onto that and like expect the sound to come. Whereas if it's constantly shifting and meandering, then you can't do that. And you have, it kind of puts your, puts you in a different state. I think it can be, um, I don't know, a little, just a little hypnotic, I guess. Um, and it kind of makes your brain pay attention to the music more because it can't predict what's going to come. So I really like that. It makes, uh, makes for even kind of the atmospheric textural parts of the music be a lot more captivating for me at least. Um, so I think it works great as a loop player and you don't have to use the sequencer whatsoever for that if you don't want to. And if you are playing things that don't need to be synced and uh, or you know are even better when they're not synced, I highly recommend that. I have a whole video on that separately um, if you want to see kind of how I work with this in that tape loop type of style. And um, I think it's a really, really compelling way to work. And I think it's actually a great complement to a very tight uh, sequencer like the Electron one where you're being very analytical and going in there and thinking about every step and tweaking things here and there, right? This is a nice compliment to that. Okay, so that's all I got. I hope that helps somebody out there. Um, I know I didn't go into like all the nitty gritty detail, but that's kind of my point here is that um, you have to kind of make the decision for yourself whether it's worth your time to really look into the detail of the sequencer and how it works. And of course, the best way is to get your hands on it and just try using it for a while. Um, I think that if you love piano rolls, then great, you got one here. And uh, most other devices out there don't have that. And um, if you love working with kind of longer melodic phrases, longer than 64 steps, and um, that's, you know, that's gonna benefit your music a lot, then I think this is definitely a strong one to look at. Um, also, likewise, if you are coming from a more acoustic instrument background and want to play in a style that's just kind of more fluid, I think this is another great one to look at for that. So um, hopefully that, that helps you make your decision. And uh, yeah, 
Have a good one.